σχολιάρει. Ε, να προχωρήσουμε στον επόμενο ομιλητή. Είναι συνδεδεμένος. Hi. Hi. Hi, Professor Chen. Good evening. How are you doing? I am very well. Good so, evening, everyone. I'm uh, here in Thessaloniki with my coach, uh, Professor Adonis Manolis. Yes. Uh, probably you know him Hello. from uh, being trained in Boston and stayed uh, at the States for a long period of time. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to present uh, to the Thessaloniki audience uh, Professor uh, Lin Ye uh, Chen, who is a distinguished uh, friend and uh, a professor at uh, the Medical School of uh, Minnesota in, in Minneapolis, or the other one around. Uh, and uh, he's an evident, eminent uh, electrophysiologist and also his uh, pioneer uh, work on invasive and non-invasive indices is uh, striking. Uh, he uh, likes uh, have, have the same interest in uh, looking uh, in P wave uh, hidden treasures and uh, getting data out of uh, the ECG, which uh, we can use uh, probably in uh, the prognosis of these patients. And uh, he developed uh, one, he actually uh, changed a little bit uh, to, to the better, the known charge VAS score and added the P charge VAS score, if I'm right, uh, Lee Chen, yeah? Uh, 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 Lin, Lin Yi, sorry. And uh, he's going to give us a talk uh, what he thinks is hidden in the P wave, or if we can find something in the P wave and we can use it in everyday practice. Where, where our ears are open for you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go to slide show. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. First, I would like to thank the organizers and Professor Vasilikos, a good friend and collaborator, uh, for inviting me to speak uh, at this wonderful conference. Now, I'll be the first to admit that I wish right now I am with everyone in Greece uh, and not here in Minnesota, uh, but unfortunately, the COVID pandemic prevents that from happening. But hopefully, sometime in the next future, maybe even in 2021, I'll be able to join everyone in person in Greece. So the topic that was assigned to me, as Professor Vasilikos mentioned, is P-Wave, the hidden treasure. Now, the P-Wave is a hidden treasure for many reasons. But today, we're going to talk about how the P-Wave is the hidden treasure because it improves prediction of atrial fibrillation related outcomes. So other than research grants from the United States National Institutes of Health, which fund my research on atrial fibrillation, I have no other disclosures. In the next 20 minutes, we will touch on the following topics. We will start with a few words on atrial fibrillation and its relationship to neurocognitive and cardiovascular outcomes. We will spend most of our time talking about this topic. What are P-wave indices and why are they relevant? Well, they are relevant because number one, as Professor Vasilikos alluded to, they can help to improve prediction of ischemic stroke. Next, they are independently associated with a higher risk of dementia, independent of AFib and dementia risk factors and they are also associated with a higher risk of sudden cardiac death, a topic that we just spent some time listening to. And again, the association is independent of AFib and cardiovascular risk factors. We will close with a few minutes of discussion on future directions for research. Atrial fibrillation. Suffice it to say that it is a major public health burden. Because A, the prevalence of this condition is increasing dramatically worldwide as populations age. In the European Union alone, 
it was estimated that the prevalence of AFib in 2010 was 9 million. And this prevalence is estimated to increase or to double to 18 million in 50 years in 2060. AFib is a major public health burden, not just because it is a very prevalent condition, but also because it is associated with morbid cardiovascular outcomes, such as stroke, heart failure, and all-cause death. And these are associations that we have known for the last four decades. More recently, in the last 10 years, emerging evidence has also shown that AFib is associated with neurocognitive outcomes, such as cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. Moreover, we, re we reported, we were the first to report an independent association between AFib and a higher risk of sudden cardiac death in the general population. And this increase in risk is about 2.5 fold. And most importantly, other than anticoagulation, which reduces the risk of stroke related to AFib, currently in 2020, we have limited options to prevent other AFib-related outcomes. But tonight, we are not talking about AFib. We are talking about P-wave indices. What are they and why are they relevant? P-wave indices are a set, include entities like P-wave axis, P-wave duration, advanced interatrial block, also known as the Bayes syndrome, PTFV1 or the P-wave terminal force in lead V1, so on and so forth. They are essentially ECG surrogates of underlying atrial cardiopathy or atrial cardiomyopathy. And abnormalities in P-wave indices reflect alteration in atrial structure, function, and also electrical activation. Of note, of all these P-wave indices, only the P-wave axis is routinely reported on all standard 12 ECGs. And the importance of this point will become clearer in the next few slides. So P-wave indices improve prediction of ischemic stroke. We recently published a review article which summarized the key evidence linking P-wave indices with increased stroke risk independent of atrial fibrillation. And these P-wave indices include P PTFV1, P-wave area, P-wave duration, advanced interatrial block, and P-wave axis. A major focus in my lab is to define the role of P-wave indices in improving cardiovascular risk prediction, such as AFib and ischemic stroke. And a particular favorite of ours is the abnormal P-wave axis. So the P-wave axis, as we know, is measured on the frontal plane. And by convention, it's defined as the normal P-wave axis is defined as anywhere between 0 and 75 degrees. Anything outside this range is deemed to be abnormal. Our initial work on P-wave axis was led by a previous fellow of mine, Ankit Maheshwari, who is now a junior faculty uh, member at Penn State. And he published this paper in Stroke in 2017 and conducted the analysis in the ERIC study, which is a population-based court study of close to 16,000 middle-aged individuals who were recruited at the end of the 1980s from four USA geographical regions. Since the baseline visit, six other study visits have been completed. The last was in 2018 and 2019. So in this paper, Ankit was interested in two outcomes, definite thrombotic stroke and definite cardioembolic stroke. He found that the presence of abnormal P-wave axis was associated with a doubling in the risk of definite cardioembolic stroke after adjusting for atrial fibrillation and cardiovascular risk factors. Although he found that abnormal P-wave axis was also associated with definite thrombotic stroke, this association was weaker, an increase of 30%. Next, 
he categorized definite thrombotic stroke into two different subtypes, lacuna and non-lacuna stroke. And this is where the findings become intriguing. He found that abnormal P wave axis was associated with a 65% increased risk in non-lacuna stroke independent of AFib. However, by contrast, abnormal P wave axis was not associated with lacuna stroke. So these findings collectively indicate that an ECG surrogate of atrial cardiomyopathy is associated with an increased susceptibility to cardioembolism leading to clinical stroke. And then Ankit decided to pursue this line of investigation further. And this time he aimed to determine whether adding the P wave indices to the CHETS VAS score would improve stroke prediction in AFib. And as we all know, the CHETS VAS score is the most commonly used stroke prediction score to estimate risk of stroke in AFib. Here he decided to employ a comprehensive approach, interrogating a range of P wave indices, including P wave duration, P wave axis, advanced interatrial block, and abnormal PTFV1. The main analysis was conducted in ERIC, and the findings were validated in an independent community based cohort in the United States known as MESA. So this table shows the association of the four P wave indices with ischemic stroke in people with AFib in the ERIC study. And he found that the abnormal P wave axis and advanced interatrial block were both associated with higher risk of ischemic stroke after adjusting for the variables in the chest first score. Next, he then added each of these P wave indices to the chest first score and evaluated improvement in moderate discrimination as measured by the C statistic, an improvement in risk classification of ischemic stroke as measured by the NRI and relative IDI. And he found that of the four P wave indices, abnormal P wave axis significantly increased moderate discrimination. Lin Yi, uh, have you muted your microphone? Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. yeah can oh, I, I apologize. Do I have to start all over again? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Second. Your last slide only. Sorry yeah. about that. I must have. Okay. Let me uh, go back to my slide. Apologize. Um, are we good now? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Based on the regression coefficients, we then assign two points to the presence of abnormal P wave axis, thus creating the P2 chest fest score. Then we compared the P2 chest vest score with the traditional chest vest score in both Eric and Mesa to evaluate the model discrimination and risk classification of ischemic stroke. And indeed, we found that the P2 chest vest score was superior in both Eric and Mesa in terms of model discrimination and also risk classification of ischemic stroke. So this set of findings here indicate that an ECG surrogate of atrial cardiomyopathy can be used to improve prediction of stroke in AFib. Now, what about P wave indices and dementia? So here is a paper that was published in JAHA in 2019, and this is work that was led by a fellow, Alejandra Guterres. And Alejandra was interested in looking at the association of P wave indices with dementia and cognitive decline. And again, this work was based on the ERIC study. So this figure shows the timeline of the ERIC study. And at each study visit, 
ECGs were performed. In addition, at these visits, visit 2, 4, and 5, cognitive tests were carried out. So the availability of cognitive test data at three time points and ECGs from all the study visits allowed us to evaluate the association of p wave indices with cognitive change over 25 years and also with dementia. So these tables show our results for dementia. So abnormal PTFV1 is associated with a 60% increased risk of dementia after adjusting for AFib and dementia risk factors. And similarly, prolonged P-wave duration was associated with a 60% increased risk of dementia. Now, a normal P-wave axis also was associated with dementia, but the risk is lower at 36%. What about cognitive change? And here, we assessed four different cognitive test scores. Delayed word recall, which is a test of memory, Digit symbol substitution, a test of processing speed and executive function. Word fluency, a test of verbal and executive function. And finally, there's a global cognitive test score. Of the P wave indices, we found that abnormal PTFV1 was associated with a greater decline in verbal or executive function and a greater decline in global cognitive function. So, the findings again here indicate that an ECG surrogate of atrial cardiomyopathy is independently associated with a higher risk of dementia and greater cognitive decline. Moving on, what about sudden cardiac death? Now, there, there are a lot of papers that we can quote from the literature, uh, but I want to show this paper, again, led by Ankit Maheshwari that was published in AJC in 2017. Here, Ankit was interested in prolonged P-wave duration and the risk of sudden cardiac death in the general population, again, based on the ERIC study. And here we found that the risk is significantly increased, you know, more than 30% increased risk of sudden cardiac death with the presence of prolonged P-wave duration. And these is our restricted cubic spline, and we can observe almost a linear relationship in P wave duration and risk of sudden cardiac death with a threshold at about 130 milliseconds. So, future directions. Our research, as well as the research of others, compel us to consider a new conceptual model. Conventional wisdom would have us believe that a lifetime of exposure to vascular risk factors would lead to alterations in structure and function in the left atrium. And these abnormalities give rise to AFib. The chaotic rhythm of AFib creates stasis of blood in the left atrium, which sets up the nidus for blood clot formation, leading to cardioembolism and then brain infarcts and clinical stroke. We submit that this conceptual model is inadequate. Yes, we acknowledge that a lifetime of exposure to vascular risk factors would lead to atrial cardiomyopathy, but we contend that this abnormality in and of itself would create the nidus for blood clot formation, leading to cardioembolism and subsequent brain infarcts and clinical stroke. In fact, some might argue that the association between AFib and stroke that we have known for almost four decades may be partially or completely explained by this relationship between atrial cardiomyopathy and clinical stroke. So to prove this conceptual model, we were fortunate to receive funding from the National Institutes of Health in the USA to conduct this study left atrial abnormality and AFib-related cerebral infarcts and cognitive decline. And there are three aims in this study. The first is to define prospectively the association of atrial cardiomyopathy with new brain MRI infarcts and cognitive change with and without adjustment for AFib. Next, in parallel, 
define the prospective association with AFib with new brain MRI infarcts and cognitive change. And this time, with and without adjustment for left atria structure and function. So by conducting this analysis in parallel, and also doing formal mediation analysis, we can tease out to what extent it is the dysrhythmia of AFib or the atrial cardiomyopathy that drive this association with stroke, brain infarct, and cognitive change. And because we're collecting other biomarkers, another aim is to define mechanisms underlying AFib stroke related stroke and cognitive change. So, Professor Vasilikos, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, P wave indices are the hidden treasure because they are biomarkers for a wide range of health outcomes, including cardiovascular and also neurocognitive outcomes. The key important thing about P wave indices, and this is a sentiment that both Professor Vasilikos and I share, is the advantage is very clear. P wave indices are inexpensive and they're easily available from the humble standard chocolate ECGs that we do on a daily basis for patients. We are in a different era of big data and artificial intelligence to increase the clinical applicability of ECGs. More research, and this is not something I've touched on maybe in future meetings, more research using machine learning and artificial intelligence would be needed. And then finally, do we need fancy tools like MRI or echo-based 3D or 2D-based strain uh, echoes? Maybe the ECG is good enough. So this is where we want to compare ECGs to echo-based indices in improving prediction of AFib-related outcomes. Finally, I'd like to thank the members in my lab, the graduate students and the uh, postdoc fellows, my collaborators and staff and participants in the ERIC study. And as always, I'm very grateful to uh, the National Institutes of Health of the United States for allowing me the time to indulge in my intellectual pursuits. So thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I will be delighted to take questions. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you. We have a, a hidden treasure for all these years, and uh, we don't look, we neglect it. As I told you, we, we had some discussions before. We were looking into the P wave for the last 12, 13 years, and we were looking with uh, the more wavelet analysis and looking into different things. Now we are proud to say that our baby has grown up and he's a, he's a, it's a, it's not an, it's a, a teenager now. <laughs> good, good things and the bad things. So uh, I'm uh, very proud to, to say that uh, these days we finished uh, the algorithm we were using on uh, the prediction of the P wave. Because we were getting data out of the wavelet analysis, we couldn't uh, actually uh, say why is this, why is that. But uh, with this uh, artificial intelligence and the, the, the mathematics behind that, we we developed a predictive model in patients without taking antiarrhythmics, uh, in patients with antiarrhythmics, with a low and a high um, volume of uh, atrial fibrillation uh, episodes and uh, we we tested it uh, very uh, it was a rough test and uh, it succeeded and uh, passed all the tests so we are very proud to, to to open it to other researchers and use it yes one wonderful yes i didn't want to mention this this work so for the audience uh, Professor Vasilikos and I, plus some other investigators, we are currently working on a consensus document, which we hope we'll, we'll have a final draft very soon. And in our discussions, uh, Professor Vasilikos has shared, you know, this wonderful work uh, with me. And 
I, <laughs> I definitely look forward, uh, you know, to the applicability of this algorithm uh, that, you know, you have developed. And uh, hopefully we'll hear more about, uh, you know, this hidden treasure <laughs> uh, from the wavelet analysis. Uh, Professor Manolis, you want to make a comment? Yes. Professor Chen, excellent talk. Uh, thank you very much. Fascinating data. Uh, I enjoyed uh, your your talk, uh, which uh, though uh, brings out a lot of uh, questions. And uh, I would uh, like to just, uh, if you have time to address uh, a couple of them. Uh, I understand that um, uh, this atrial cardiomyopathy uh, can uh, go on to um, uh, infarcts, uh, brain infarcts and uh, and strokes without um, going through the atrial fibrillation phase uh, from what uh, you described. And that also is in keeping with a large study, epidemiological study, and I'm sure you, you're aware of, uh, showing that the CHADS-VAS score uh, in patients without atrial fibrillation also predicted uh, strokes in a very large uh, uh, population. So it seems that uh, atrial cardiomyopathy is uh, the background of atrial fibrillation and many other uh, problems uh, um, related to vascular factors that you mentioned. But I, I would like your, uh, to know your input about the pathogenetic me mechanism of the uh, relation and the, the relation with the sudden cardiac death that you mentioned. Uh, what do you think is, uh, is the substrate there? What happens? Uh, the, atri uh, the atrial abnormalities and the atrial my myopathy correlates with uh, what? The ventricular uh, arrhythmogenic mechanism or what's happening? Mm, okay, that, that is an outstanding uh, question. So in addition to prolonged P-wave duration, which we showed in that AJC paper, there have been other studies uh, using different P-wave indices like PTFV1. So there's a paper published by uh, Larissa Tereschenko, who is uh, an investigator in Portland, Oregon. And he she showed, and again, this was using the Eric study, uh, an association between PTFV1 and a higher risk of sudden cardiac death. There are many possibilities, but I suspect, and I suspect that it is due to concomitant underlying increased fibrosis in the ventricular myocardium. In fact, there is one paper, um, I think it's known as the primary study, primary study, I'm blanking on the citation in which journal, where the investigators compared, they did MRI scans in the hearts of individuals where they have measured the P-wave indices. And they found that the presence of abnormal P-wave indices is correlated cross-sectionally with a higher burden of fibrosis within the ventricular myocardium. So in other words, I think it's not a direct relationship between atrial cardiomyopathy and increased vulnerability to ventricular arrhythmias. But I think atrial cardiomyopathy is a marker of greater cumulative exposure or damage from vascular risk factors that affect the structure and function of the atrium. And then at the same time, also affects at the microstructure level of the ventricular myocardium. So in a way, it's like a, a barometer of, uh, it sums up the damage to the heart uh, because the left atrium is the first to be exposed, right? To, I mean, the left ventricle, yes, is the first to be exposed to systemic hypertension, but you know, the left atrium is very vulnerable to long-term exposure and long-term damage from vascular risk factors. So I think it's underlying fibrosis in the myocardium. Vasily, if, if I'm allowed one more uh, question, yeah. if I may. Uh, uh, I think we'll leave yeah. just an answer. Yeah, Andoni, yeah. No. Have you uh, come up with uh, this uh, um, excellent work that you've done uh, all, uh, all this time with a score or a graded scale of all these indices? Um, uh, a cumulative kind of score that uh, would um, would um, be helping out uh, clinically to decide um, the severity of this uh, atrial myopathy? Using ECG? Yes. Uh, it's ongoing work. It involves, I, I would say that it would involve, uh, you know, machine learning 
right? Because you want to use an unbiased approach uh, and an unsupervised machine learning approach to identify clusters of people with atrial cardiomyopathy with deferring risk, right? So this, this is work uh, that is currently ongoing. And um, what I'm envisioning is not just limiting to ECG, although, you know, that's the topic for today, and that's the common interest of Professor Vasudekos, myself, and others. Uh, but I think the echo parameters play an important role, you know, such as uh, LA reservoir function as measured by speckle tracking, you know, strain analysis. So by incorporating ECG indices, uh, perhaps strain measures from, you know, 2D echoes, and maybe even, you know, like clinical factors, right, clinical variables, we might be able to come up with an algorithm to cluster uh, people with atrial cardiomyopathy. Have you correlated uh, your findings with um, uh, MRI findings like the Utah group have done or uh, with um, uh, electroanatomical mapping? Okay, so I, I have not done it with cardiac MRI with late gadolinium enhancement uh, because the collaborators I work with, the cardiac imaging collaborators whom I work with, they all feel quite uh, doubtful about you know, a standardized and reliable protocol to measure, you know, fibrosis in the left atrium. Uh, as you know, uh, that work is, you know, is controversial and, you know, not everyone has to Yeah. But electroanatomical mapping, I've not systematically looked at it, but there's no question that, uh, and this work, this is work that's been published. I think in people with abnormal P with indices, there will be areas, heterogeneous areas of low voltages in the left atrium and the right atrium. And don't thank you. Would, congratulations. We may have uh, the the answer to this. Uh, we one of uh, my PhD students is looking into the correlation of our P-wave analysis and the, the electroanatomic findings. So we'll know- I knew you would uh, say no. so. <laughs> yeah. I suspected and, uh, it. From uh, your old uh, hospital, Antoni, in Athens. Yeah, <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> uh, finally, one last practical uh, question, uh, Professor. Yes. Uh, how is it, how easy is it uh, to measure the P wave? Because sometimes, you know, it's not very clear where the P wave starts or usually where the P wave ends. <laughs> how, how accurate is it? Because, you know, we found that it's a problem sometimes. Sometimes it's very clear, but not always. Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. And I believe we actually discussed that, you know, uh, just recently earlier this year, right? Uh, the answer is it is very, very difficult. And uh, it requires quite a bit of subjective human judgment, I would say. Uh, but of course, we can rely on the machine to determine when is sort of the beginning of the deflection and the end of the deflection. And that's the reason that we are particularly interested in the P-Wave axis, because A, we don't need specialized software to measure, let's say, something like PTFV1. Clearly, you will need specialized software to measure that, right? Or P wave area, you will need specialized software to measure. P wave axis purely relies on the the magnitude, and you know it's a, it's a measure of the the axis, and it's a summation of the the magnitude of the P wave in uh, the different frontal leads. So that gets around the problem, right, uh, with studies of. Uh, knowing where exactly it starts, where it ends, it's much easier to identify where's the peak of the P wave, uh, and especially when it's automatically read. Does that answer your yeah, question? The, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Life, uh, uh, difficult. Yeah. Quick question. Professor Chen, um, any uh, patients of yours had any atrial um, amyloid cardiomyopathy, isolated atrial cardiomyopathy, or just uh, amyloid cardiomyopathy? 
in um, that you have studied? Uh, yes, in fact, there are people with amyloid cardiomyopathy in the Eric study also. And and your question is, how, um, what are the P waves? How do they behave in terms of these indices? Are they helpful? The indices, the P wave indices, in um, determining the uh, the degree of uh, atrial uh, dysfunction. Okay, I've not formally looked at whether abnormal P wave indices in people with amyloid cardiomyopathy, right, are associated with worse outcomes. But just cross sectionally, we know that the prevalence of abnormal P wave indices. In atrial, in amyloid atrial cardiomyopathy, is is much higher than those without uh, atrial cardiomyopathy. But I think that's an excellent question. I, I suspect that it can be helpful, right, in predicting okay. risk of stroke and outcomes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chen. It was an amazing uh, time to have you with us, and uh, we learned a lot. Uh, we hope next year to be with us here in Thessaloniki. Uh, we, we, we still have to wear masks. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we, we have to plan uh, a new meeting. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, That's why care. I'm not in Thessaloniki. No, thank you very much for the invitation. And hopefully in one year we can meet in person. That, that will be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.